Well, good morning and welcome to this, our virtual service. And, you know, before I dive in, I have a number of things to say before we get to the message this morning. And one of them is, you know, I really just want to take a mental health moment, uh, really, for all of us, because we're all reacting in different ways to the current crisis. And, and I just want to assure you that a lot of this is normal. Uh, some of the things that you may be feeling right now, you may be feeling guilt uh, about not accomplishing more. I mean, this is what you've always waited for, all this time off for those of you who are not working steady. You know, you, you should be accomplishing more with your kids. You should be accomplishing more with yourself, doing all those projects you've always wanted to do. Relax. It's okay. You might be having guilt, actually, about still having a job. This is something called survivor's guilt. Uh, where you know that there are lots of people who are unemployed and you might be related to some or you'd be friends with some. And so you have that, that sense of guilt. You might have anxiety about the fact that you may be losing your job soon. You may also feel anxiety about actually getting sick, uh, about getting COVID-19. Let me assure you, after having been through the fires of Slave Lake and seeing a whole town in crisis, I can tell you this, all these feelings are normal. They're very, very normal. Right now, a lot of us are in crisis mode, which means we're in shock. Things are a little blurry. All the days are sort of melding together. You may feel very tired. You may be mentally tired, physically tired. You may be sleeping more. You may be hypervigilant. Maybe you're not sleeping at all. All of these things are normal. Your normal routines of eating, exercise, all that sort of thing is probably thrown out the window. Don't worry about it. You're in crisis mode. It's okay. Everyone reacts differently. And one of the things that I've tried to encourage all of us to do is not shame the people who are reacting in different ways than we are. Everyone reacts differently. It's okay. I just want you to know that, that I am praying for you. I pray for you daily. And it's because I care about you. And I want to thank all those of you who have listened to uh, the messages, uh, the devotionals during the week. You have sent me messages on Facebook and email and text. Uh, I have been very fortunate to have such encouraging people around me, to have such an encouraging church. And for those of you who are not part of our church, I've been getting encouragement from you as well. So thank you for sending all of that in this past week. That meant a lot to me. In this particular service, at the end of the message, we are going to celebrate the Lord's table. This is something that we do as a church at the first Sunday of every month. It is a normal part of our routine and it is something that Christ commanded. Now, for those of you who aren't, you know, you don't have a church background and maybe you're struggling with even the concept of God. Hey, you don't have to stick around for that point. You can, you can leave and that's fine. Or you can kind of take it in and, and watch and see what that's all about because it might not be familiar to you. Uh, once that is done, there'll be some music that uh, we offer to you to help those of you who, you know, you connect with God through music and it helps you to worship. We're going to have that as well. One final thing, you may not know this, but our church has something called a consent list. We live in the age where we need consent to send you things. And for some of you, we don't know what your email address and we don't have consent for you or from you. But we do send out a lot of uh, information during the week and we can't get that to you without your consent. So if you think about it, give the, the office uh, your email, give them a call, whatever it takes. Just let them know, hey, I want to know what's going on at Nanaimo Alliance Church. And you can get on that consent list and you can uh, kind of have the inside scoop on all of that. So let's, uh, let's dive into the, the message for today. And I know that right now, all of you watching, and there are people watching from really all across the country at this point, uh, many of you are not churchgoers, and you're just kind of checking this out. I want you to know you're safe here. This is this is a good place for you to be, and I'm glad that you're here. Some of us have, have faith, and some of us really struggle with the concept of God. And so when it came to this particular series about Judge Judy, I thought, wow, do we, do we continue with this series? And this particular message, you know, judging Christians, thinking, why would an, a person who's not a churchgoer be at all interested in that? And before you 
you know, before you exit, uh, you know, onto something else and, and uh, play more Minesweeper or whatever, um, <laughs> you can, I just want you to know that this message actually, I think, has something for everyone. Because as I thought about it more, this message is really about how to have genuine relationships with people. And whether that's your marriage, whether that's your family, whether that's your workplace, or in this case, the church, the concepts are all the same. And I want to help you today to have better relationships with, with people. Look, a lot of us are in our homes now with the person that we're married to and with our children. Uh, some of us, you know, we're, we're in with our, our parents. And those relationships are going to get stretched and stressed, perhaps, during this time. And so I want to give you some tools to help you at this time to perhaps deepen those relationships and make them richer than they were before. Look, you know, when it comes to talking about judging or sin, these are not the most favorite things I, I have to talk about as a pastor. But I realize that over the years I've been a pastor, I realize how important these these concepts are, how important it is to have genuine relationships with people and to address some of these things. I've seen what happens when I don't address these things. And I see what happens in me when people don't address these things in me. So this is really about having strong friendships, strong churches, strong families. And I, I invite you to kind of come along this journey with me and you may have to translate at times the concepts from the church to your particular sphere, but the concepts are the, are the same. Uh, I think when it comes to the, the term judging, I think we often mix this up as we're judging the person. We're, I'm not talking this morning about judging the person. God judges people. But as I said in the first message in this series, we have to judge. It's, it's part of uh, a necessity in life. We have to judge people's choices, whether they're right or wrong, whether they're for us or not for us, whether they hurt that person or whether they are hurting other people. We, always, we are constantly making these judgments and we have to. And here's what I don't mean though by judging. I don't mean placing ourselves above others. That's not what I'm talking. And I'm not talking about condemning people using guilt or shame or anger. And maybe that's what some of you are thinking right now. When you think of judgment, that's what you think about. Someone coming down hard on you. And I'm not talking about making up your own standard. You know, all of us bring in our own culture, our own upbringing, our own experience. In the case of the church, we have all agreed that what is right and wrong has been given to us God has inspired the writers of the Bible to tell us what God thinks is right and wrong, and that is our standard. But I understand some of you may not have that same standard, and and for and right now, that's okay. The, the concepts will all be the same. We are talking about assessing behavior, and we, we all do this. So here's the thing that I want us to take home with us. One phrase, and it is this. A connected church is a corrected church. And you may translate that in, into a connected family is a corrected family or a connected workplace is a corrected workplace. And, and feel free to uh, make, make those substitutions as we go through uh, this message. Some people think, you know, well, you shouldn't really judge anyone. You should just be nice. And, you know, I look at Jesus and Jesus was the ultimate in love. And Jesus wasn't just nice. He told the truth. And in order for us to have real relationships with other people, we have to have both the grace, the, the nice part, the kindness part, and also the truth. Um, so, you know, things get really dicey in the church in particular when uh, people are doing something that's hurting themselves or they're hurting someone else. And they won't stop. Even when it's pointed out, that's when things get really messy. And, and you've seen this and I've seen this. It creates circles of collateral damage. And that's kind of what we're addressing here today. So let's, uh, let's get into this. Uh, and the first, the first point today is this. Uh, we have to judge followers of Jesus. It, it's, it's a necessity. And Jesus talked 
about this and gave some instructions in Matthew 18. And he, he said this, if, any, uh, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Now, not all of the earliest manuscripts have those words against you. That's why I put it in brackets, and, and some translations will do that. But either way, what the, the point is this. When someone is sinning, when someone is doing something wrong, Jesus says, don't walk away from them. Walk towards them. And the ideal is, if, when, when that happens and you say, hey, you know, this is really hurting you or hurting someone else, the ideal is they go, you know, you're right. You're right. I got to stop doing that. That's wonderful. That's great. I wish that was the case in all situations. But Jesus knew, and I knew, and you know, that's not always the case. That's ideal, but not always the case. So he continues. And he says, but if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Of course, it's not best to involve others. That just makes people even more defensive. And even this, even when you bring someone else in to try to reason with someone, even that sometimes doesn't work. So Jesus continues on and he says, If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a tax collector. I know it sounds rather extreme to get the whole church involved, but think about it this way. One person's sin can begin to have an effect not just on their own lives or necessarily on their family. It can begin to affect larger and larger circles and eventually affects the reputation of the entire church. Think, think about it, how, how it works in, in, a, in a family you know that uh, when someone is doing something that is wrong, it affects the reputation of that entire family. I know it's not right. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. And so sometimes it's necessary for the whole church to get involved, just as sometimes it's necessary for the whole family to get involved when someone is doing something really, truly hurtful. Uh, Jesus said these words in Luke 17, 3. He said, he said, oh, I didn't have a slide for this. That's no big deal. If any, if another believer sins, rebuke that person, he said. Then if there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, you must forgive. And so he said, here's the thing. You have to judge. You have to judge their actions as wrong. You have to. And when they repent, you also have to forgive. Neither one of these things is optional. So now let's go on to the second thing. When we judge, we are to judge humbly. And this is so very important. Paul writes to the church in Galatia these words. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. I got to tell you, I love this verse. And it's a great reminder to me. It says, yes, you have to judge. You do, because someone may be overcome by some sin. But go and approach them in a very soft manner. Being humble. Uh, this is so important. We are to help each other out of the wreck that we find ourselves in. Which may mean... You may have to drive that person to AA. You may have to walk away when they are gossiping. You may help have to help them find a counselor or have a long coffee with, with them. But I love the warning in this. This is so humbling. He says, there's a warning. He said, when you're approaching someone about their sin, be careful. Because you are fully capable of doing the same thing. I think we often think, I'm not capable. I would never do that. We often think these things. And here Paul is saying, don't think that. That's dangerous thinking. You are fully capable of doing those same things. Uh, Peter Scazzaro writes in his book, uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he says, I must see the extensive damage sin has done to every part of who I am. Emotion, intellect, 
body, will, and spirit before I can attempt to remove the speck from my brother, brother's eye. I think that is so important to recognize the, the darkness within our own sin until we get a really good glimpse of how bad that is, how big that is. We are in no shape to go and talk to someone about theirs. Here's the thing. Here's quite, quite the principle. Get this. The more judgmental a person is, the higher up they think they are, that makes them the least qualified to confront anyone else about their sin. We can't approach from above. I liken it to this. I don't know if this is, you know, the right analogy or not, but I, I liken it to if morality was altitude, then God is looking for more trains. Trains stay on the same level. And that's what God's looking for. If we think we're an airplane and we are at a higher altitude than someone else, we are the least qualified to go and talk to someone else about their sin. God's looking for trains, not airplanes. All right, so let's uh, continue on to the third point, which is this. Judge for the right reason. Paul writes to the church in Corinth this. He says, we pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. Notice he's offering correction. He's already judged. This is just part of being in true relationship with each other. He said, do the right thing before we come. He's going to come visit. So he's do correct this, make it right before we come. For we cannot uh, oppose the truth, but must always stand for the truth. Now watch this last part. This is to me the most important part for our discussion today. We pray that you will become mature. That's his whole motive in approaching this church about what they are doing uh, that is wrong. He's saying, look, we want you to grow. We want you to mature. We want you to become like Jesus. We want you to have that level of maturity. Here's the, the strange thing in, in, in church circles, and if you're not part of church circles, this is going to sound really weird, but it's true. Churches will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on curriculum to help people become mature, but we often sometimes we often don't do what is free which is talk to people about the things that we see that they're doing wrong, the things that are hurting themselves and the things that are hurting others. It's a tragedy that that happens. And, you know, in, in families, we may invest in have, spending time together, in having vacations together. Maybe right now you're playing games together. We're phoning people. But sometimes we don't, won't do what is truly necessary, which is to talk about the tough stuff, the tough stuff things we we see how they are hurting themselves or hurting others and we won't be honest so why why is sin so often left unjudged in churches and you know the the principles here are the same in families in marriages in workplaces you watch this this is this is amazing how how much these overlap so the first one is isolation you know, in the, when the church first started meeting in the first century, they, it says they met every day. Well, you get to know people pretty well every day. In today's context, a regular attender at church is considered to be someone who attends once or twice a month. We're talking like an hour or two a month. How well do you really get to know someone? Now, in, at Nanaimo Alliance Church, we have connect groups, so people are spending more time with each other during the week. But even then, it is possible to not really know someone and their lives are generally a secret. I mean, what are people really like at work, at their kid's soccer game, in traffic? <laughs> How do they treat the waitress? What are they really like at home? See, we can't confront the unknown. And so often people will purposefully stay disconnected so that no one can really talk to them about their lives. The disconnected stay stuck. And they don't, unfortunately, mature. The disconnected don't mature. Second reason is fragmentation. You know, it, in, in church circles anyway, uh, it's easy to just up and leave. And this happens in workplaces too. Someone will be confronted with something they're doing wrong. And they just up and they go to the next place of work. Or they go get up and go to the next church. You know, when, when the church first started back in Jerusalem, there was only one church. You were in it or you were not in it. 
You couldn't go down to the, the church down the street. The, the church was called the way. <laughs> and today, it's more like our way. Hey, you don't like their way? It's okay. Come and hang out with us at our way, you know? But really, the church is the way. And, you know, we're, we're just not as loyal, perhaps, as, as we once were families, friends. How easy is it these days to just unfriend someone and move on when they start speaking truth uh, to us? Next thing is mutiny. <laughs> uh, this, this is kind of a, a fun one if it wasn't so tragic. Um, so if someone is confronted with something that, that they're doing wrong, it is really easy for them to take all their hurt feelings and go and gather around people and say, man, you know, so-and-so told me I'm a real gossip and that just really hurt my feelings. And now in that moment, true friends... True friends will say, well, you know, you kind of are. But quite often, that's not the case. <laughs> we gather around people who tell us exactly what we want to hear. Oh, they're full of hogwash. They don't know what they're talking about. Ah, come on. It's true. Hey, I, I get it. We all like to play the role of the savior. We all like to play the good guy. You know, we get to be in there and pat them on the back and say, ah, they're not. That's not true. Ah, oh, man, you know, it, taking the role of the Savior is addictive, and it hurts people. It keeps people stuck. Don't be part of that. And so mutiny is part of what keeps us unhealthy and keeps relationships unhealthy. And final is dismissal. And the way this works is we see some, something happening in someone's life that is not good, and they're hurting themselves or hurting others, and we go, eh, but that's not up to me. That's up to someone else. And I see this happen in the church. And we probably see this in families. We see this in workplaces. We go, oh, that's the boss's job. Or that's the parent's job. Or that's the pastor's job. That's someone else's job. Here's the thing. Those closest to the person should be the first responders. Those closest to the person should be the first responders. Because they know the person well enough. They have built up that relationship, hopefully. It's harder to just dismiss people that we truly care about. Now, you may wonder, well, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but are there specific examples of, of this kind of approach in the New Testament, in the Bible? And people would be really surprised to know there are several examples. I was amazed at how often this is brought up. At, at how people were, were disciplined in love, in care, because they could see them going off track and they need to be brought back on track. So just as a few examples, first of all, there was someone in the church in Rome causing divisions. He said, stay away from people who are causing divisions in, in the church. But, you know, people who are just stirring the pot in your family or in your workplace, these are not the kind of people you want to hang around with either. Uh, moving along, in, Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He said, there are freeloaders. There are people who are just getting freebies, you know, free food, free clothing, whatever it may be. And they, they have no intention of, of working or earning a living and they're fully capable. He said, don't hang around with those people. And also, in, Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, there are people that you come across who are conscience violators. They are doing something they know is wrong. When people are doing something they know is wrong and they have no intention of changing it, he said, don't hang around with those people. He wrote him a second letter and he said, you're going to come across in the last days people who are pleasure worshippers. They'll be people who, eh, if it feels good, do it. They really don't want to follow Jesus' example. They like the title of being a follower of Jesus. They like the title of being a Christian, but they have no intention of following Jesus' example. He said, don't hang around with those people. And finally, there's an example. John write, uh, writes that there are people who uh, are teaching wrong things. They're actually telling lies, essentially. The Bible says one thing, they're saying another. And they're teaching lies. It says, in the church context, anyway, these are not people that you want to hang around with. They're, they're just telling lies. They're wrong teaching. And so there's all kinds of these examples in the Bible about uh, people keeping, the church keeping a distance from them. But you can translate that maybe to, to family. And it's harder with family, harder with friends, hard even at workplace. 
So what should we do if we're if we're really going to oh and sexual sin I forgot to mention uh, in First Corinthians five as well uh, it was mentioned that uh, sexual sin was one of the the reasons that uh, Paul said you can't hang around with this person they're sinning sexually and I, I've talked about that example uh, other times I won't get into it but just so you know these are if you look at that list that's a lot of examples in the New Testament uh, of times where uh, the the writers have said you, you can't hang around with these people you you, you need to judge them uh, hopefully they'll repent hopefully they'll turn around and and things will change that's ideal but they may not and you may need to distance yourself from them so what can we do first of all uh make confession routine and i i look to dietrich bonhoeffer who was a pastor during nazi germany who opposed the nazis uh, he said he said this he said if my sin appears to me in any way smaller or less reprehensible in comparison with the sins of others then i am not yet recognizing my sin at all i think oh that's pretty sobering when you think about it that i have to take my sin very seriously and one of the ways we can do this is by making confession a regular part of our conversations. There's, there's no reason why we can't be talking about our own failings, our own shortcomings on a regular basis. It keeps us humble and really keeps us real. It keeps us as trains <laughs> rather than planes. It keeps us grounded. So make confession routine. If you're part of a, a connect group, then confession should be part of that. If you're in your marriage, in your in your family, in your friendships, take the opportunity to be humble and be free about talking. Hey, we've all got stuff that we do that's that's not good. And we we all have weaknesses. And to talk about it, make confession routine. The second thing is accept correction. There's no way that we have any right to go to someone else to correct them if we won't accept correction ourselves um, to paraphrase Jesus he he said shovel your own dirt pile before you smooth out your friends before you attempt to smooth out your friends anthill you know take care of your own stuff before you start dealing with other people's stuff and finally love your church family and you could uh, substitute friend or family in there love them love is full grace and full truth with full grace there's care there's kindness there's understanding and truth in the context of the church is God's standards for holy living that's what we have agreed to this is what we agree as a church defines right and wrong for us that God does that and actually God's person defines right and wrong for us now I want to dig a little bit deeper because here's something that's really interesting to me in all these examples of correction that are mentioned in the new testament the the final straw the final act in dealing with people who will not change who want to keep going down this wrong path who keep veering off and hurting themselves and hurting other people did you notice all the time what the bottom line was the worst thing they could possibly do was separation that to me says a lot because when a church when a family when a friend a group of friends is so loving the worst possible thing that could happen to them is to be separated from that group we are naturally drawn to people who love us who genuinely love us and if you can easily walk away from someone or some group you were not in a loving relationship so keep that in mind. that's true of marriage it's true of friendship it's true of family it's true of church when we love people we correct for their sake not our own a corrected church our connected church is a corrected church but the truth is if we love ourselves more if my comfort is more important than your growth if my safety is a higher priority than stopping your unloving behavior, then we're really only just loving ourselves. 
again, going back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, nothing can be more compassionate, compassionate, than that severe reprimand which calls another Christian in one's community back from the path of sin. Have you ever thought about that? That's compassion. He said, when, when we allow nothing but God's word to stand between us, judging and helping, it is a service of mercy, an ultimate offer of genuine community. Then it is not we who are judging, God alone judges, and God's judgment is helpful and healing. Loving churches are filled with grace and truth. Grace is undeserved kindness. So if we want to be in uh, a loving and real relationship, whether it's in the church, whether it's our marriage, whether it's with our friends, we make confession something that's normal. We open ourselves up to correction and we love them. We offer full grace, but also full truth. No matter what context we find ourselves in, love is grace and truth. A connected church, a loving church, a loving couple, a loving family is a corrected church, marriage, family. Every relationship, and I'm going to end with this, every relationship that we have, no matter what the circle is, has the potential to be richer and more fulfilling. Truth and grace will get you there. Now I wonder, is there someone that God is talking to you right now? That you've been putting something off, you know you need to speak to that person. Or maybe you're not ready to confront someone. Maybe you are unpro unapproachable. You've kind of told people, no, I, I don't want to talk about my issues. And deal with that first. And allow, just ask God, say, hey, come and help me deal with this. In fact, why don't we do that right now? Why don't we pray that we would have this ability? Would you pray with me? Lord, I ask that for whether we, whether we are yet followers of Jesus or not, that you would begin to soften our hearts, to be humble, to allow people to speak into our lives that we would then be able to address others and be honest with others and build strong relationships. Lord, I pray for all the people who are watching this right now. I pray if they are married, for their marriage, for their friendships, for their families, and for their churches. Lord, that they would be filled with genuine relationships, honest relationships where things are spoken about, difficult things are spoken about, so that there would be health and healing. Lord, there's a lot of healing, I sense, that needs to take place in the relationships in our lives. Heal those relationships through honesty, through humility, in your power and in your strength. Help us, Lord. Amen. Okay. Now, for those of you who want to tune out now, feel free to do that. And for those of you who want to celebrate the Lord's table, here, I've got some uh, instructions for you uh, because this is, this is kind of brand new to all of us. And you may be saying, hey, wait, I'm used to having some people give me what I need. So for those of you who, who don't know, when we celebrate the Lord's table, there's two things that we need. We need uh, some kind of, of bread. And Jesus said this was... Uh, this was his body. This is symbolic of his body that was broken for us. And the juice, normally we, we use juice. Originally they used wine. Uh, he said this is his blood that is spilled for our salvation so that we could be forgiven. He gave his body and his blood for us. And so he said to do this to remember him. Now I'm going to take a moment and you can pause this because you're going to need these things. Now, you may not have some of these things. So, so here's the deal. You can substitute whatever you want. You may not have bread. You might have a cracker, a, a chip, uh, something that, that provides a, a decent substitute. If you have um, you know, health restrictions, uh, dietary restrictions, find something that works for you. As far as the juice is concerned, you probably don't have grape juice at home. Uh, you may uh, not have wine at home. And that's your business. 
but you could substitute some other kind of juice. Uh, you could substitute water or milk, whatever it is. I understand that you may not have everything that you need, but you know what? God knows your heart. He knows the situation we're in, and uh, he knows that not everything is readily available right now. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this, and we'll continue on when we're done. Okay, by now you have everything that you need. We are going to dive into a little bit of scripture. Paul wrote to the Romans a classic passage in Romans 3 that is going to set the, the theme for this morning. And uh, let's, let's dive in. He said, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Jesus went to the cross for everyone. Sin affects everyone 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 is guilty and that's why jesus went to the cross if people could find a way to god other than the cross they would have done it but jesus said there is no other way he is the only way you can paul writes he says yet god with undeserved kindness this is grace he said with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. Righteous means having a right relationship with God. He declares that we have a right relationship with God. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. God pursued you to free you from the penalty of your sins. And not just some of your sins, all of your sins. Wants to wipe it entirely clean. This is the beautiful part of what we are celebrating, what we are remembering right now. And finally, he, he ends with these words. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. My question before we go on is, are you right with God? And if you're not, if you do not know God yet, this is the most important decision of your life. This is the most important thing that could happen for you in this whole crisis is that you get to know God for maybe the for the very first time. And you can do that by, first of all, repenting. That means turning from your sin and saying, God, I know I've hurt myself, I've hurt others, I have hurt you. And that is wrong. And I'm going to turn away from those things now. And then trust. Repent and trust. And trust God. Trust that He knows what is best for you. Trust that He knows what is right and what is wrong and he wants to guide you trust that he is on your side and wants to mature you and bring you the very best life possible all that is trust and if you do that right now turn away from your sin and trust in God you will have started a relationship with God and these elements these things that we are taking are meaningful to you now because you are saying this is now part of me when you take when you take Whatever bread you have, I've got a, I've got a cracker here. And you take it and you recognize Jesus broke his body for you. That's powerful. That is so powerful. And you're, and you're saying, I'm taking this and it's becoming part of me. Go ahead and do that now. Thank you, Jesus. And then take whatever it is, cup that you have. I just have a simple Tupperware cup. And uh, whatever you have uh, in that, remember, for right now, this represents Christ's blood that was spilled for you to free you from the penalty of your sins so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees his child completely clean, wiped, of all the sin from your past, present, and future, he sees you as pure and perfect, the New Testament says. He sees you as perfect because of Christ. Let's remember him together.
let's close this time with prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have freed us from the penalty of our sin. That we no longer have to walk around with guilt and shame. That you have freed us from the weight that was upon us. For all the people that we've hurt, including you, we are forgiven because of Christ. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. He is our substitute and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for taking upon you the penalty that is ours. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to be the Savior of the world. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now there's going to be some music and I hope that you continue on watching that. Thank you so much for being with me today and I hope that this, this time together has really encouraged you and strengthened you and comforted you. God bless. Good morning, church. As we've just had communion together, I want to lead us on a song that reflects on what Jesus has done for us, but also on how much the Father loves us. Let's sing how deep the Father's love for us. songs for our service this week it's it's been a hard hard experience for me Saturday morning I've been working on this for a few days just trying to record a couple songs and it's way harder than I thought nothing's familiar nothing's comfortable I imagine that many of you feel the same way right now whether you're cooped up at home trying to get used to new ways of doing your grocery shopping or if you are working still 
you're probably working in different ways and um, possibly busy. It's all can be really unsettling. I know for me it's really hard to to do this right now, even just to lead music. So these next couple songs that I've picked out for us, uh, the first one's a song that I learned years ago when I was in college and it's called Safe Place. And I just want that song to be a reminder to us that, that God is here for us and that uh, no matter what's going on around us, we're in his arms.
want to sing one last song and uh, hope it's an uplifting song of encouragement for us this week. I'm going to sing about the faithfulness of God. Grace be enough for you this week. Bless you. Amen.